You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Well, welcome to the Foundry Church today. As we get going and looking at the Word of God today, we're going to talk about following closely. One of the, when I think of the phrase following closely, you have the image of like little ducklings with their, with the mom duck waddling ahead of them. But I have a different image from my childhood. Uh, my granddad, he, my granddad Cox on my mom's, my mom's dad, he had this great laugh. And when he would laugh, it would just, he was this big bear of a guy, pretty serious. But when he would laugh, it just lit up the room. And I remember, I remember him telling a story of his friend, Jack. Jack and Levita Hall were a couple, and they, they were friends with my grandparents. And Jack was notoriously tight-fisted. He didn't like to spend money. And there was a time where one of his cars broke down, and he wasn't going to pay a tow truck. And so he talked to his wife, Levita, and he said, I need you to kind of get up on my bumper and push me home. And she was like, okay. And, and he said, you, you've got to stay right up on it. And, okay, all right, Jack. And then uh, he, she said, well, how fast do you want to go? He said, about 35 miles an hour. <laughs> and so she gets in the car and she turns and she turns around. And he looks in the rearview mirror and here comes Levita doing 35 miles an hour. And she just tasted him, and like wrecked the car. It was awesome. I mean, my granddad would laugh, and it was, his whole face would glow. But the, the madness didn't stop there because Jack, his cars only got worse after this. So, so Jack had another breakdown, and he goes the same route again. He has Levita push him home. And he said, first get up on my bumper and slowly get me up to about 35. Roger. She's going to do this, right? So she gets on the bumper and she starts pushing him and, and the car's going and she didn't get up to 35. So Jack, being impatient, puts his arm out the window and is like, come on, hurry. She slows down, pulls around him and drives home. She couldn't quite get the concept of following closely, safely, and not colliding, right? And when I think about that, I just love the idea, isn't that us as disciples, Right When we talk about following Jesus closely, I feel like sometimes we're a little bit more like Jack and Levita than, than John and Jesus. Like I, I feel like we, we clang into things and we miss it. But the reality is for us, as we dive into the Word of God today, there's, there's hope for us. There's hope that um, those of us who count the cost of following Jesus will not only find it altogether wonderful to follow him, but we will also find ourselves fully alive in his presence. So join me as I read Luke 9, 57 through 10, verse 1. It said this, as they, the disciples and Jesus, were walking along the road, a man said to him, to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replies to him, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the, proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replies, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. After this, the Lord Jesus appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he planned to go. This is an interesting scripture. When you look at it, some of the interactions Jesus has with people. These are some of the more commonly quoted little phrases we, we know in Christianity. So when we look at this, we must first take a moment and talk about discipleship. Because if I said, you know, like, do you want a disciple? You, most people in the world would be like, is that some kind of popsicle? Like, what's a disciple? You know, it doesn't, it's not a word you hear really outside of the church. But when you look at discipleship based on what Jesus was doing, there is this first century understanding of what it means to follow someone. See, discipleship in first century Jerusalem, Judea, and Israel was where a rabbi, a teacher, would call people alongside them. They would say to them, follow me. 
and those people would follow them. But there were also people who, think of it like graduate school, like going to get your doctorate, but the way you get it is to get next to a person who has their doctorate and you follow them and learn everything they know. And you, you learn kind of by this active kind of relational aspect of it where you're following someone and you're emulating them in everything they do. Disciples were common. Pharisees had disciples, right? John the Baptist, we read about him the other week, had disciples. Gamaliel had disciples. All these different people had disciples, people following them, learning from them, emulating them. And and one of the realities of discipleship in the ancient world, especially the first century, was this understanding that um, what the rabbi did, you did. So there wasn't any deviation. You were trying to be just like the rabbi, the teacher, your master. You were surrendering your life and you were following and becoming the rabbi. And it was a life where many of the people who who would come up to like a rabbi and say, can I follow you? Like we see in this story, remember? The, The guy comes up and said, I will follow you anywhere. He was saying, can I be your disciple? And quite often, those people would have memorized the entire Hebrew Bible at that point. The prophets, the law, the history, the wisdom books, they would have memorized it. They would have known it by heart. But they were taking what they know, and then the rabbi taught them how to um, understand what it meant and how it directed the lives they lived out. So for them, it was a living engagement with the word of God and a person who they would follow. This person would become transformational in their understanding of not only who they are, but what they're called to do and how they're called to live it out. They would literally become a mini-me. They would act just like the rabbi. They would emulate them in every way. So we learn really three major lessons when we look at this. There's three major lessons that we see in this from um, the scripture reading. Jesus has three encounters, and they're all directly related to and using the language of discipleship. Luke, the author, really is, if we were Jewish in this century, we would know exactly what he's saying. We would know that this was all about discipleship. It's the follow me language. It's the cost of discipleship. And when we look at this, Jesus has these three encounters, and he has three different responses that he gives to them. And and we need to look and ask, what is Jesus, well, what is he teaching us about discipleship through these encounters? The first one is this, counting the cost right? Counting the cost. We see the first person come up to Jesus and says, I will follow you anywhere. I will go anywhere with you. And Jesus replies to him, foxes have dens, birds, they have have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He has no place to lay his head. It tells us this, and I think it's important for us to grab onto this. Jesus isn't at home anywhere, in this world. Jesus isn't at home in this world. He's never comfortable in the sense like he's putting his roots down here. He's, he, his home isn't here. And you can almost feel like he's not grasping for all the comforts and the luxuries that um, the disciples would have longed for and these different things. He was saying, look, even animals have it better than I do right now, is what Jesus said. Like, think of the polar vortex just a couple weeks ago, which, ironically, it's raining today. Michigan has weather problems. But, um, but like, you think about it, and I walk out the door, and you, like, go to, like, snowblow your driveway or shovel it out if you're unfortunate and don't have a snowblower. You go out there, and you see little bunny tracks in the snow, and you're like, oh, poor little guy. You know, you, like, didn't. Does no one else have compassion on the bunnies? Like you see them and you're like, oh, what are you doing in this? And Jesus is saying, they have it better than I do. This is more their home than it is mine. Because I have no security in this. No comfort, no security. Calling. Jesus talks about calling. His comfort and security isn't here. His calling is what gives him purpose in this life, not what he has. So Jesus, responding to this man, says, don't look for comfort and security with me. Look for calling, look for purpose. That's where you'll connect in this. The next thing we see 
in this is um, is that we we have this counting of cost, but then we have Jesus kind of declaring that he comes first. Jesus says in the next one, when a man comes up and says, um, he goes up to the man, sorry, and he says to him, follow me, follow me, right? This would have been super, this is like your dream college having, um, uh, no, the better example would be if you love like Michigan football and Jim Harbaugh came up to your house and said, hey, come play for me. You'd be like, no way. It's happening, my dream. Or if you like a different team, you know, if you like State or it's not Izzo. Who's the other, um, what's his name? Dan, D'Antonio. Like if D'Antonio came and talked to you. Um, if you like Ohio State, we're not even going to talk about them today. But, um, but if they came up and said, hey, come play for me, it would mean a lot to you, right? Jesus goes up to this person and says, follow me. And the guy's response is interesting. Okay, but let me go bury my father. Contextually, we know and we understand that for this guy, it could have meant that his dad just died. Or it could have also meant that he was the oldest son and he's saying, let me go put my father's household in order because I am going to walk away from my kind of birthright and follow you at great cost. And Jesus' reply to him is let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. It sounds so mean, doesn't it? Like when Erica and I were talking about this, she was like, when I was little, it sounded mean when I read this. It just seems cold-hearted. But it's not. It's not cold-hearted. It's saying, I come first. Jesus is saying, I come first. Here's what I know about this. The very first commandment given to us in the Torah, in the law of God, is um, that you shall have no other gods before me. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You shall have no other gods before me. Here's what I know to be true. About 10 years ago, I was sitting with a mentor of mine, a friend of mine, who um, was just very influential in my life, and he said, tell me the priorities of your life. Have you ever been like asked that kind of question, right? And you're like, oh, And you have to do a quick summary of what my priorities were. I did this. And I said, okay, it's Erica, um, my my wife, my kids, God, the ministry. And he said, that's not right. And I was like, but it's true. (laughs) Like, I, I know it's not the answer you want, but it's super true. It's super true. If I was honest at that time, which I was, my first priority was Erica and my kids. Then it was God. Then it was the ministry. That's what owned my heart. And it was a moment of conviction because he kept saying, that's not right. And I kept saying, but it doesn't matter right or wrong. It's true. And he said, you got to fix that. And I'm like, I, I don't know how. I love her. I love them. I can't just trade that out, right? I can't just not do this anymore. But it began something where God convicted me, and I had to do that thing we talked a few weeks about, like that dig step where you repent and you turn and go the other way, and I had to work on that. I had to literally force myself to um, put Erica in the right place in my heart. She was in the wrong place. It's God first. It's you shall have no other gods before me. And no, she's not a deity, right? Right? But she, she owned a spot in my heart that she didn't belong in. And it wasn't her fault. It was my lack of priorities. So when I look at that, I can say this. Ten years later, I will tell you this. My first priority is my walk with the Lord. My walk with the Lord. That is my number one priority. Then it's my wife. And I believe, um, and I've talked with Erica about this before I said this, um, I believe I'm a better husband today than I was 10 years ago. Because though she was number one in my heart, everything was out of balance because I had the wrong priorities. I had other gods living in my life. It put her in a place she shouldn't be. What is God over your life? What is your number one priority? And if you're like, I don't know, what gets all your time? What gets your time? There it is. There it is, right? It's, it's this thing where, um, where we have to reconcile in our own life that we, we have other gods, and they may not be some carved idol, which if it is, it's pretty, 
clear and you should get rid of that. But, um, but usually it's much more nuanced than that, right? It can, be, it can be our social media, it can be our sports, it can be our academics, it can be our career, it can be our title, our influence, our spouse, our friends, whatever it may be. It can be another God. And I will say this, I'm actually a more loving and I think servant-hearted husband now than I was 10 years ago, not because I'm awesome, but because my priorities are correct. God sits in his seat in my life and I don't occupy or put things that occupy the number one seat. And that's what Jesus is saying. Let the dead bury their dead. Don't let other gods own your heart. Follow me. Let the cost of discipleship be counted, and then follow me. Follow me, choose me first, and make sure that Jesus is always first. And it sounds very basic, but when Christ is first, our calling is always interwoven with the life we live. And we begin to live in this, um, in this, it's not always, doesn't always feel peaceful, but there's a deep abiding peace of who Christ is in and amongst our own life circumstances because his purpose and his calling are number one. He's number one. And then he weaves himself into all the parts of our lives where there, what life where there is balance and there is purpose. The third thing we see And no is coming out of this idea that your relationship with God and obedience to Christ comes first. Coming out of that, we see this third thing happen. We see this third thing happen. First, we counted the cost. Second, we made sure that, you know, God comes first, Christ comes first. And then another man comes up to Jesus in the story. In um, verse 61, it says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me go and say goodbye to my family. This is really fascinating. In an era of John Deere tractors with GPS tracking, tracking, where you can plant 48 rows of corn at one time, and it's really, farming's a big industry. Back in this day, in the agricultural day and age of the first century, the John Deere tractor was, you know, the Paul Ox tractor. It was a big cow with a yoke, a big heavy wooden yoke, and a plow. And the, and the guy driving the ox would have one hand on like a guide stick, keeping the ox straight, right? And uh, the other hand on the plow, making sure it was doing what? It was taking a straight track across the field. And when you plow with an ox, you can't look back because what will happen? Inadvertently, you'll turn, pull, like it's when you look over your shoulder to change lanes and you accidentally change lanes. You're like, I wonder what's over here. And you're like, oh my word. And it kind of gets dangerous. That's, that's what he's saying. You can't take the, the calling, the, the plowing job, and, and plowing the field with an ox and look back. Because when you do, you're going to intersect all, you're going to trample on the lines you just planted. You're going to smash and ruin and intersect the, the, the rows where there's going to be abundant life. And Jesus says, if you're called to follow, follow full-heartedly, don't look back. He's not saying you can't say goodbye to your family. He's saying it can't own you. And when we look at this, we understand that you can't serve wholeheartedly if you're constantly looking back at what you stepped away from. And this is where I think it gets really nuanced and good for us in our culture. See, there's two angles on this. First of all, there's the second guessing. Do I have any second guessers? Like you, th- you, you make a decision. You're like, you know what? I'm going hamburger. And then you get there and you're like, oh, later on you're like, I should have gone cheeseburger. Could be that small. Yeah, right? We have second guessers. We, we constantly second guess. And here's what I think second guessing does. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about Jesus in the soil. And he talked about the three different kinds. And there was the soil with the thorns. And the the cares and the pleasures and the worries of this life choked out the faith. I think second guessing is the thorns. Second guessing is looking back over our decisions and wondering like, you know, you get a ways down. You can make a decision um, on December 31st that this year is going to be your healthiest year ever. When's it tough? When you're at the fair in July and you're second guessing that decision because there's fried Oreos in a booth, right? And you're like, nah, did I really want to lose weight this year? I don't know, but I do know right now, I want the fried Oreo. I want the thing that makes me second guess. 
So when we look at this, we realize our second guessing can cause us to instead of attending to the calling God gave us, we are looking back going, man, maybe I should have taken a left back there and done something differently. Maybe I should have gone a different direction with that. And we realize that our second guessing causes us to trample on the new life we've, that God has planted and it really messes up the ministry we're called to purposely live into. And so what we can't do is constantly look back at the things we've stepped away from. I don't know what you've stepped away from. I just know this, that if you're in Christ, there's part of your life behind you that you no longer participate in. And you can't constantly look over your shoulder and go, man, maybe I shouldn't have quit doing whatever it is, whatever that thing is. The way I like to imagine this is you can't, you can't be doing the work like Jesus said. You can't have the plow and the guide and look back without crossing things up. And in my mind, I think of it this way. You can't hit the last pitch they threw. It's over and done. If you're swinging at that pitch, you're never going to hit what's presently in front of you. You've got to pay attention to the here and the now. You have this moment to obey, to respond faithfully, and to be courageous in following like a disciple would following closely and emulating Jesus in the easy and in the difficult things. We learn that for us, this is where belief becomes, well, alive. Because in the, in the ancient world, in the first century, this is one of the major nuanced differences that we know happens or happened linguistically. Belief to you and I is more of a noun, a person, place, or thing. To all my English teachers in the past, thank you for that. I hold on to that truth. Um, so person, place, or thing, right? And how many times do we hear people say, I, I have my beliefs? Anybody ever heard that? Yeah, I have my beliefs, or this is my belief. You can't move me from it. A belief is not a person, place, or thing in Jesus' context. It's a verb. It's an action. It's a living thing. You become what you believe in action. Belief in this context is not intellectual assent to a creed or a doctrinal statement. It is living, relational, emulating of your rabbi. And Jesus is our rabbi. He's our teacher. And we follow him closely and we actively believe in participation. We don't hold a belief we become the belief, which holds very close to our theology, to our value at the Foundry Church, transformation. If you're coming here to stay the same, you're in the wrong place. Don't stay at the Foundry Church if you don't plan on growing in your faith and becoming more like Christ. We're all called to that. Our, we are all called to live into the verb belief. Our belief is a living activity that we grab onto and live into. And I think for you and I, we have to know that this matters supremely because all the things in discipleship are active, following, walking away from a past. None of it's static, just holding on to a truth. That's not what it is. It's a living, following, active emulation of who Christ is, what he called you to, and how you're called to live it out. And here's why it matters. Here's why I believe this matters. Because the kingdom of God is constantly coming into this world, invading this world through the spirit-filled lives of the church, through you, through me, and through the community of Christ pushing the kingdom forward. The kingdom of God is constantly coming via the spirit-filled church. And what we're doing is we're changing the cultural status quo by following closely to Christ and emulating him. We are beginning to reflect him, not just in behavior, but in being. And for you and I, that is a critical understanding, and that's why I want to dive in in this last verse and just look at this as we kind of wrap this up. The last verse we look at today said this, after this, after the three following engagements, Jesus says, it says, after this, the Lord Jesus appointed 72 others and he sent them out two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go. Isn't that interesting? Into every place that he was about to go. He was sending them out to prepare people to meet him. 
This is the coolest part of it to me. This is where it's so amazing. If you're a good disciple of Christ, you are only preparing people to be introduced to Jesus. They're not being introduced to you. Your your life is preparing them to meet Jesus. Jesus was sending people out to prepare them, to prepare those towns and villages to meet him, the Christ. He sends us out doing the same thing. He's sending you to people to prepare them to encounter Christ. So that when Jesus comes into their life, there's some ring of familiarity because why? His disciple who emulates him, who is so much like him, has already crossed their path. So he's not a complete stranger. They've already experienced in some measure who Christ is. I believe this. Scripture interprets Scripture. You've heard me say that before. Here's one of the cool things. When Jesus, before he was born, there was John the Baptist, right? And John the Baptist, remember him? Crazy, he ate bugs, wild honey, wore a leather belt and like a camel coat and lived in the, in the wilderness of Judea. He was sent to do one thing, to prepare the way of the Lord. Remember? It says that John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. Even now, even right now in our context, we are seeing how Jesus is sending his disciples back then in the ancient world and right now in our present day to do the same thing John the Baptist did, to prepare the way for Jesus to come and invade this world. So my challenge to you is to follow closely in active belief and faithful engagement with the word of God through devotions, with the community of God in worship, but also in groups, getting into groups and then in your workplaces, in the lives you live, getting into those lives and sharing Christ in such a way by the belief you have, which is a living thing, your beliefs become a manifested way of revealing Christ so that when he crosses people's path, they recognize him because they knew his disciple. There's something of him in you. So when we look at this, we know our challenge is quite simple. To own the gospel by following closely, by being a disciple, to being right on the heels of Jesus Christ and learning to behave as he behaved, learning to love as he loved. And here's the thing, you can't do it physically in in your own head and emotionally. We're gonna fail every time. That's why we are gifted the Holy Spirit to fill our lives time and again and we take on the winsome joy of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the Spirit's job is to reveal Christ to the world through the church. It's what he's been doing since Acts chapter two and what he continues doing today. Disciples of Christ are spirit-filled culture changers by preparing the way for Christ to walk in to the lives of people all around you. The challenge is yours. How will you emulate Christ so that when people meet him, he's already familiar? He's like a brother or sister. They already know who he is because they've been around you. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way you work and live in our lives. We just ask that um, as we who have gathered here today, as we gather, that we would learn and be courageous to follow even as you've called us. You give us courage to follow and endurance to see the task through. Thank you, God, that your spirit fills us. And thank you that we are people called to prepare the way. May we not look back, but may our eyes be ever forward in the purpose and the calling you've given us by present active obedience to you. Help us, God, to count the cost, to put you first And Lord, in the end, to never look back. We love you and we thank you that we can trust your character as we begin a life of faithful following. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.